Uh, this morning, it's a, a second sermon on uh, Psalms, uh, also on a, a Psalm of Ascent. Uh, I'd like, first of all, to uh, read to you um, the Psalm. It's a very short Psalm, which I think is actually very nice, so that we can actually maybe look and see what we observe together. Um, the title of my sermon is uh, Lift Up Your Eyes to God, <coughs> and you'll probably see why. If you look up on the screen, uh, you will see I've highlighted a few words. Let me read to you and just keep an eye on the words I've highlighted. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid servant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to you, Lord our God, till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease of the contempt of the proud. I think one thing you can notice down there is the words uh, eyes comes out often, especially when you see it's a very short psalm. <coughs> It's kind of noticeable, right? Four times. I also want you to notice that uh, it begins with an I and then it moves to a we. So it is a prayer that is both an individual prayer and also a prayer uh, for the community. So let's look at some basic observations of Psalm 123. Like I mentioned, it's a short psalm. And I hope as you read things like this, you will see uh, words just pop out. Some words will stand out. <coughs> Psalm 123 is sometimes called by some people as a psalm for the eyes. Obviously, because the eyes, the word eyes occurs four times. And also notice, I've highlighted for you, that the word mercy occurs three times. So again, a simple observation when you read your Bible, when you read a psalm like this as you meditate on it, you begin to realize that the focus of this psalm is lifting up our eyes, which is focusing on God and in particular, God who is a merciful God. So this psalm really is about trust. And the question you need to ask us is, do you trust God? Now that sounds a bit simplistic. Do you trust God? <coughs> but more specifically, it is about trusting God uh, when people are mistreating you. The question asked is often to people um, who come to me with, issues and problems, sometimes I ask them this, that uh, who do you look to first? In times, except for example, when a few people are mistreating you, we're having struggles and problems. Who do you look to first? Is it God? And I think that's a good question to us ask about everything in our lives when we face challenges and things. Who do we look to first? Uh, do we call a parent? Do we call a husband or wife? Do we call our best friend? Do we you know, go look on the internet for help? Uh, I mean, who do we look to first? And we find that the psalmist starts by telling us to look to God. In his time of need, first of all, he looks to God, and then he leads his community to do the same. So Psalm 123 begins with the psalmist lifting up his eyes to the Lord. And you will notice that in the words he uses, his posture is important. It's that of a humbly requesting, Right? but also with a sense of expectation that God will answer. And so by looking to God first, he's actually acting in faith that God is able to take care of his needs. And the reason is very simple. Why? Because he sees and he believes that God is enthroned in heaven and he is ruling as a sovereign king over everything. And it's important to understand this imagery of God sitting on the throne in heaven. And because some people misunderstand it. And John Golden Gay uh, puts it this way. I like what he says here. He says, sitting in the heavens does not suggest remoteness or non-involvement in this world, but rather than Yahweh is enthroned. And from there, as sovereign Yahweh can and does come to intervene in the world down below the palace. I remember years ago that, that song, you know, when everybody liked to sing, God is watching us, you know. Like above, it's far away, and they get the impression that you know God looks down and look at us. But 
He doesn't get involved. Our God gets involved. And this is a very, very important concept to grasp when we pray. We must believe when we pray that God is also not just almighty, but also willing to get involved in our personal struggles. He can and he does intervene in our struggles because he loves us. Now, this seems so basic, but I want you to think back and look through the Bible, especially when you go to the New Testament. Do, do you realize that, uh, I think I mentioned it before, that this word that is used for faith, pistis, that's translated faith, is also translated trust, it's also translated belief. It's the same root word. And the difference comes with looking at context to help us understand in English and also whether it's a verbal form or a noun form. So belief, trust, trusting, faith, having faith, it's all the same thing. <coughs> and trust in God is important when we pray because we say, oh, we need to pray in faith, but praying in faith means you trust. We say we need to believe and that's exactly the same. So prayer, actually, if you think about it, makes very little sense, right? And there's no power if we don't have confidence in God's power and God's love for us. And that's why for many people, our prayer doesn't make any sense and prayer is so-called not effective. James puts it this way, and we are looking at James in basic, just so happens. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, you, you know this verse, listen to what it says. James puts it this way, but let him ask in faith, Okay, it's faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So again, I want you to look, when you read the Bible, and you see the word in the New Testament, believe, trust, faith, realize that it's the same word, pistis. It is translated faith, trust, belief, again, depending on the context and the grammar, a very, very important concept. So again, think about it. Do you believe when you pray? Because prayer makes little sense and there's no power if we don't have confidence in God's power and also have no confidence in the fact that God loves us. It goes hand in hand. Some people believe that God is all powerful, but you also must believe that God loves us and he will respond. Now, it just so happened that uh, when I was preparing all my pastor's notes ahead of time, uh, this week, if you look at the bullet, if you follow it, you'll see it's about Noah. And, and Noah's a very, very wonderful character in the Bible. And, and I just mentioned some of the little things there, to just one aspect of his life, and you can see something interesting, right? Noah trusted God. And, and sometimes we misunderstand when we don't read the Bible uh, more. We just listen to the Sunday school story in here and we don't look at the details. We miss out so much because we remember the story of Noah and the ark. Even non-Christians will know this story. Oh, you know, 40 days and 40 nights. And we think that's about it. You know, it was raining 40 days, 40 nights and after that everything was okay. You read very carefully, you'll know that it was about uh, almost a year before he could actually come out. And throughout, you read the story and just that one aspect of his life only, you will see the kind of faith he had and trust in God. And listening to God to know when he should get out. So that's very, very important. So now the question to ask is, as you see, the psalmist is, a, is praying in times of need. In particular, you know, people are kind of abusing him and he's struggling. What does he do? How should we pray to God in our time of need? And this psalm, short psalm, just gives two helpful things I want to emphasize. The first is really is we, we need to focus on God. Keep our eyes on God. Two things about that. First, he says that God is king and we are his servants. Now, this is an aspect of relationship with God that is often neglected because we, we like to remember, and it's true, God is our friend. <coughs> God is our friend, he's our saviour, he's the one who rescues us, he's compassionate. But here, the emphasis is to help us remember that God is a king and we are his servants. That's a very important aspect to think about. And the second is, despite the fact that God is the king and we are his servants, God is a merciful God and a just God. And that is why the psalmist knows when people are attacking him and he's feeling down, he knows that God is a just God, a merciful God, and he will respond. Also, a very, very important aspect of God's character. 
just not about God being loving, that's true, but also have you thought about and meditated on how God is merciful and God is just? So when you look at the first aspect of God as king and we are his servants, this is verses 1 and 2. Now, I want you to notice again the analogy of master and servant. And you know, I mentioned before, when you see a psalm and things in poetry, uh, if I just say master and servant, that the point is clear as it is, right? I mean, you don't need to explain anymore. Why does he use now mistress and maid servant? It's the same thing, basically. <coughs> Even though you may say, oh, it's about male and female. It's the same thing. The idea of all this thing is to emphasize again. So that we can stop and say, why does he bring it up again? That, remember the synonym, synonym parallel? <coughs> it brings it up again, so we pay attention. See, it's Almighty God is a God who has a relationship with us. And the very interesting thing is the relationship is for us is this. We are need to be thinking as servants who are very focused in looking at the master and paying attention to what the master says and what he does, his gestures. And I think this, I like this thing that came out. A 19th century person wrote this. <coughs> this is from 19th century. That's a couple of 200 over years ago. It's a traveler who says this thing. He observed this thing in his travels as he went, you know, from the west all the way you know, to the east. He says this, travelers tell us that when they go to a house of a wealthy person in the east, the master will give certain signs to his slaves and refreshments are brought in. But except when they are called, the servants stand at a distance. They are watching for the slightest motion of the master's hands. They do not have the liberties that we happily accord to our servants, but they are just not nothing and nobody, mere tools for the use of the master as he pleases. And as to the maidens, I've heard he said that the women on the east have a harder time of it with their mistress rather than men have to be the masters. The lady of the house is a more severe taskmaster than the husband is. So the maidens watch the mistresses very carefully, for they are sorely afraid of them. And they look with great fear and great care to see what the madame would have them do. Now, of course, here the analogy breaks down because, and I'm glad he mentioned this, now casting aside, he says, everything of human fear out of this analogy and this figure. That's not the way we ought to look at God. But the general idea is there. You see, an Eastern master seldom speaks. And he mentions this story when he goes, he saw this. A gentleman went some time ago into this Eastern master's house. He said as soon as he entered, he was observing, the master waved his hand. And the servants brought in sherbet. He waved his hand again and he brought in dried fruits. He moved his hands in a different way and they began to spread the table. And all the time, not a word was spoken. But they perfectly understood the motion of his hand. And they had to look sharply to see how the master moved his hands so they might know what the motion meant. It's like a strange, you know, personal sign language. And so you see that that picture, if you look at it that way, maybe this is what we can see in the psalm. We are asked to pray to God from this posture of humility, submission, and this focus. We're keeping our eyes on God. Because often when we pray, we don't realize God has actually answered. Have you noticed that? So when God responds, we are aware and we respond appropriately. See, many Christians pray and they expect God to answer in a certain way. But when God actually answers, they are actually unaware that God has answered. Because the expectation of answered prayer is very, very narrow. They think when I pray for this, God must give it this way. That's not how God works. And as those of you who have lived a long time as a Christian and walked with God, you will actually realize this is true when you go back and look at the times when you wondered why God didn't answer. <coughs> he did. An illustration I like uh, comes from, you know, Corey Ten Boone's book, The Hiding Place. So some of you may know about her. She's very famous. And, and uh, she lived in World War II. And, and one part of the story which is very familiar, but I want you to see in a, in a wider aspect, now, she was in a concentration camp, right? A Nazi concentration camp. And, and Corrie Ten Boone was there with her older sister, Betsy, and a lot of other women prisoners. And, and you know, when they were put in that kind of situation, they were always in danger. They knew they were very afraid of the Nazi prison guards. Okay? So obviously, every day, they got together and they prayed to God for protection. 
make our life easier, basically, right? Help us take care of us. And how did God answer their prayer? Now, when you look in a roundabout way, it actually came because they had smuggled in an old tattered Bible and they began every day to read the Bible. And they read it together and Betsy, being the older sister, was the one who led and said, now we must obey what God says. And then they came to this verse which we all know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In all things, be thankful, right? Be thankful in all circumstances. And so when they read it, Betsy, being the leader, said, now what we should do is we must thank God for everything. And so they did, except for one thing. They were praying aloud, thank God for this, thank you God for that. Now, can you imagine now they're in a concentration camp, they're in danger of their lives, and they're thankful to God. And then came the part, they had a lot of fleas in that particular <coughs> barrack. And so Betsy said, let's thank God for the fleas. And <laughs> Corey said, no. She hated fleas. And I, I think you know because every year I get bitten by some fleas. And after you get bitten by fleas, even though your house is not flea infested, it lasts for weeks. I will scratch and scratch and scratch and then when it seems over, the next day it starts again and then you just drives you crazy, right? You can't sleep at night. Just one time when you bite and then you find everywhere. Then when you check, actually say, no, no, we check, no, no new bikes, so we are okay, you know, no new bikes, but it lasts, right? She said, I'm not going to be thankful for fleas. But Betsy insisted, no, God says be thankful for all things and we need to be thankful in all circumstances. So reluctantly, she prayed aloud, okay, thank God for the fleas. Now later on, they had discovered something interesting. Do you know why they found that the Nazi officers and prison guards never disturbed them? They never even entered the barracks you know, to harass them you know, and do all kinds of unthinkable things. Why? Because they knew they had fleas there. The fleas actually kept the women safe from being molested and abused. And for them, the best part, as she reflected later, is they never found the Bible. <coughs> and we had our Bible the whole time. You see, that's how it looked, looking to God and seeing things, and God answers in strange ways. So how many times have you prayed for help to God? But actually, God has answered, but we never, never saw the signs. See, God is our master and we are his servants, and we are in no position to insist to God how my prayer must be answered. He is almighty and all wise. He decides. But our job really is to keep our eyes on God and watch how he responds. And often you will find he has responded. <clears throat> now, if it doesn't make sense to you now, if you're an older person, even if you're in the teens, late teens, it's something I tell people often to do. <clears throat> Take a big piece of paper, the bigger the better, you want a few small pieces, and, and start writing down in a timeline from the beginning to the end, of the start of your life that you can remember and to, up to right now, and start writing down the highlights of your life and all the negative things that in your life, <clears throat> the key things in your life, ups and downs. If you mark them down, you will remember them as you pray to God, asking God, please reveal. He will actually reveal, you know why? Because you will remember, right? You will remember the highlights of your life. Oh, the day I got married. Oh, the day I graduated. Oh, the day my girlfriend left me. You know, the day you know, I got so sick or hospital, I was scared I was going to die. You will remember these things. <clears throat> and you write them down and you see ups and downs in your life. And then you go back and you pray. You spend some time. I used to take a whole day off and go somewhere and just pray. And you actually find and you ask God, what did you pray that time? And you will see that God had a reason for every single one of them. <clears throat> they guided your life. They molded you into what you are today. And sometimes the sad part is we never noticed it. You never noticed it. God answers. So here is important to know the difference between an Eastern master, Eastern mistress and their servants is that God may be our master, but God loves us. And God is a merciful God. So he's not mistreating us. <clears throat> Next thing we need to know is we need to pray to God and realize that God is merciful and just. Now, this is important, you see. When we ask for mercy, what does it mean? Please have mercy. When you ask for mercy, it, it, it really assumes the fact that you don't have a right for it, right? <clears throat> you don't deserve it. If not, why you ask for mercy? So the implication is when we ask God for help, we don't deserve it. Okay, but 
We know because God is merciful, He will actually respond to our cries of mercy. And when we are oppressed, especially when you're going through very difficult times, and the, this is the example in this psalm, the rich and the proud are oppressing him. And not only him, <coughs> but his community. And he knows that God will answer our cries for help because it is just. And what's that verse we all know from the New Testament? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Think about it, remember it. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in help in times of need. That's the promise we have. <coughs> we can enter into prayer to God anytime, anytime at all. Throne of grace. That, that God who is sitting on throne above is actually a God who is willing to listen. He's not there, up there, alone, cut off from us. <coughs> How do we then pray to a merciful and just God? Well, I want you to notice a very interesting thing about this psalm. <clears throat> do you notice there is no asking for retaliation against the wicked for the injustice? Now, not, uh, well, sometimes you find where people want to ask, oh, please kill them, kill them, make them suffer. But here's very interesting, and I wonder whether it's because you're going to the temple to worship. And you're going to get all the negativity out. Justice and judgment are left to God. And that fits in the idea of we being servants and God being the master and king. God will leave it to you. And, and for some of the, uh, the leaders who know, I told my story how when I came and all the kind of things happened in my life. And that was one of the turning points in my life when I refused to take revenge. <coughs> I refused to take revenge for things injustice done. I said, I leave it to God. God, God said, you leave it to me. I will take care. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. I remember reading Romans, I said, why does God say that to me? It's not fair, it's not right. You're destroying my life because of what people say, and it's all not true. And God said, no, it's your, trust me. <coughs> don't seek revenge, don't curse, don't whatever, you just carry on, leave it to me. And he did. Took many years, but he did. And you look what the psalmist says, instead of fighting, he leads the people to ask God for help. And here is a very, very important aspect. <coughs> they tell God their pain. More than enough is mentioned twice. Remember, mercy, that is be gracious, is mentioned three times. And you look at verse 1 and 2, they trust that God will answer in his time. I don't know how you pray, and sometimes we feel afraid because we... It's all these, you know, things, and I don't want to look bad. But God doesn't care. He knows everything. He just wants us to be ourselves. Of all the 150 psalms in the Bible, do you know that 59 of the psalms are considered psalms of lament? That's almost 40% of the psalms. A lament psalm is this. A lament psalm is the psalm where the prayer, the psalm is focused on praying to God to ask for help for answers. And basically a lament is a complaint. You see, you're complaining to God, it's not fair, God, why are the people doing this? Why do these things happen? Why, why, why? And how come that's in the Bible? It's a reminder for us that God says, tell me your pain. And how many of us, when we are struggling, we have a lot of issues and things, when we go to talk to a friend, we can trust and we just unburden. We feel better, right? Because many of us, we, we have this thing where I, I don't want to share my pain. I want to keep it myself. It's all private. I understand that. But there's got to be some avenue to let it out. <coughs> so we need to have good friends we can talk to. But sometimes when we are stuck, who's the first person we need to call? Straight away, God. And God actually understands. Talking about troubles helps us, right? Why do you think counsellors are, are doing so well in this world? <coughs> Why do you think they're so busy? People go for counseling for help. There is no one better to share our pain than with God. And I have done that numerous times in my life. And it really does help. Look at the psalm again. Let me, let me read to you again. To you I lift up my eyes. O you who are enthroned in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of the servants look to the hands of their master and the eyes of the mistress, uh, maid servants to the hands of the mistress, so our eyes look to you, O God, till he has mercy upon us. He will. 
Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our souls have had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease and of the contempt of the proud. And they go and pray to God. Do you remember that lesson from Peter walking on the water? <coughs> go back and read Matthew 14. I don't want to talk about it too long. But the basic gist is this. Remember, he saw Jesus walking on water? And what he asked, he says, I asked, he asked Jesus, enable me to come up on the water. I want to come. Ask. And so he said, yeah, he obeyed Jesus, come. And so he went. He was doing very well, right? Remember the story? And then what happened after that? He started looking at the waves and the wind, and then he started panicking, and he started to sink. Why? We know what it means. He took his eyes off Jesus. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And of course, Jesus didn't say, well, you never look at me, no faith, that you can drown for all I care, I'll find someone. No, no, he picked him up, lifted him up. We know because Jesus' words to him was what? Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? <clears throat> you see how it connects with, Psalm, with, with James? Do you see how faith, belief, and trust is the same word? Your little faith. You asked me. I asked you to come. You were doing well. And then you start looking elsewhere. And then, <clears throat> you have no faith. Do you know what the secret is to type road walking? I well, I don't think I can still because I'm very clumsy and I've got not much balance. But I found it very fascinating. There's a guy by the name of Dan Turman. Uh, he wrote a book, it seems called Off Balance on Purpose. I haven't read the book, I've read extracts of it, okay? He was a business leader and he was a tightrope walker. Okay, so not bad, huh? Combination. And he writes about tightrope walking. And, and the idea is this the daredevil, you know, tightrope walkers, you know, you see that, they're quite amazed how they, they do it on, you know, on. Above, there's something with no net and so on. <clears throat> the, the technical term for them were called the funnabulist. Funnabulist. And, and he says that the secret one thing you need to know is they are, they're never truly at rest. They're not always on balance. And I find it a very interesting parallel to our Christian lives. You know, it's not like it's always smooth sailing. It's just always not balanced. And he, this is what he, he, he wrote, one of the extra, uh, excerpts. He says, fandom bullets are perpetually off balance, making adjustments that bring them through a point of balance, okay, only to readjust on the other side. Most of these movements are so subtle, they are, they are imperceptible to the audience. They make it all look effortless, but it's not nearly as easy as it looks to maintain their balance. He says, when new students step onto the rope or cable, they almost always begin with the same flawed plan. What do they do? I think you know. They stare down at the wire to ensure that they have the proper footing. And he says, and so they fall. Every time they do that, they will fall. He says, what's the solution to this dilemma? He said, if you've ever watched closely professional tightrope walkers, you may recall they never look down at their feet or the wire all to either side of their hands, all to the balance pole. They don't do that. Rather, they keep their head straight up. They always look towards the goal, the faraway platform in front of them. You see the principle, how it applies? <coughs> see, when we pray for help, when we pray to God, our eyes need to focus on Jesus, not the problem, not the answer that we want. And when we do that, we're actually going to find and discover wonderful things about God. And there's a New Testament passage I want to share that is, I think, a really great passage that echoes Psalm 123. It not only reminds us of the importance of looking to Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus, but it reminds us too that the Master, our Jesus, who sits on the throne, identifies with our suffering and He suffers for His servants. And wonderfully, that was read for us this morning. <coughs> it's actually Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 to 3. But I want to read from verse 1 for the context. <coughs> Remember this? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also weigh every weight aside and sin which clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that set us before us, looking to Jesus, 
the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Did you see the parallel there? Looking to Jesus, consider Jesus, focusing on Jesus, and where is Jesus? Just like in Psalm 123, he's enthroned above. <coughs> you see, looking to Jesus requires spiritual vision and perspective. That's the answer really to prayer. Think about this. I love this words by this guy called Frederick Landbridge. Two men look out through the same bars. One sees the mud and one the stars. So when we look at situations happening, <coughs> what do we see? Well, if I look to Jesus, I'm going to see stars. I'm not going to see the mud and the problems. And that is really important. So the question to ask is look at Psalm, I think when you go back and read again Psalm 123, what do you see when you lift up your eyes? And we read through the whole series of Psalms, right? You notice it started starting on Psalm 20. I lift my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? Now he stopped looking at the hills. We reach under Psalm 123, he looks straight to God on the throne. And I want to remember too the things I've shared and trying through sermons when I ended the year, start the year, I thought about looking at Revelation again. Remember what I was trying to say that living in the present in the light of the future? <coughs> things are tough, but how do we cope? Because if we look at Revelation and think we see that Christ is on the throne, I see the future, I'm not so worried about the present. So Psalm 123, in summary, is this, a reminder for us to lift up our eyes to the Lord in faith so that we may experience the almighty, the all-wise, the all-merciful, the all-just God who loves us. Let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, help us to focus on you, <coughs> to turn our eyes upon Jesus. It's like that beautiful hymn that we all know and we sang. And we realize as we look upon Jesus, all the things of the earth will grow strangely dim <coughs> in the light and the glory of Jesus, that all our problems and issues will just fade away. <coughs> they may still be there, but our perspective changes. And we know, Lord, and we are in trouble, and we learn to look to you and pray to you. You will answer because you are a merciful God. But help us, Lord, to be patient, <coughs> like Noah was patient. So many years he took to build that ark. <coughs> and one whole year stuck on the ark, waiting for the right moment when you said, now you can come out. Help us to see you, Lord. Help us to walk with you so much as we learn that we've launched this new Bible reading program. As we get to know you and reflect and meditate on your word as we study and read, and help us to know your ways, so that actually when you answer and do something in our lives, we actually won't miss it. We see it because our eyes are focused on you, our master, and then we will be filled with joy. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Could we rise for the benediction? <coughs>